a little bit of housekeeping uh, in terms of informal you know, conversations with people. Some people said, where are those PowerPoint lectures? So if you go on to Canvas and you click on this, that's going to download that PowerPoint thing for you. It's also available under the file section, uh, and you can download it there as well. Um, and this first lecture, I don't have a lot of notes that are in parallel with that. Subsequent lectures, I, I do. So I mean, you won't catch the hand waving and you won't catch the spontaneous, this idea just popped into his brain, so he said something. But you'll get kind of the gist. The reason that I'm recording today is it's been my objective to record the Zoom things and make them available to you for your review. People seem to think that that was really nice. Generally speaking, to the extent that I can, I don't post those on Canvas. I post them on YouTube. And the reason I post them on YouTube is I can, I can put time of date stamps on it and you can click at the thing you want to hear about, which is a little bit nicer. Uh, but I did that the last time in Zoom and that was all really kind of easy because we were doing things on the interwebs. And I'm not sure how it's going to work, saving it and then sending it to myself and so forth here. So it's my, I promise, my best effort to try to get something to you. The reason we are not at full classroom today is we have some illnesses. So they have said, you know, this is at least a way you can get things. And I will try to have that up. I'm probably not going to get it done today because I've got the second class to teach and then I've got a staff meeting in the afternoon. But I can probably do it Saturday morning. Uh, any questions about Canvas land? And, you know, learning objectives are more or less what we're seeing in the book. But 20 of you have re read chapter, the, the first chapter, and that's pretty good. And you're spending about 33 minutes on it, and that's kind of good. It's a little on the lean side, but I'm assuming as you go through the inquisitive, you're going to be opening it up and spending more time on it. So all is well in that department, but you know, do give it its time. Uh, Kind of as we get to know each other and we're a little more comfortable, I think it would be nice if we got to this, this point where there's a little bit of lead time where you can at least skim the chapter before I start lecturing on it. And the motivation for that is you could say, I don't understand what the hell this word means. And we can have the classroom do its work and have the textbook do its work. And I realize that's a change for a lot of you because often you do the lecture and then you go back and say, now, now that I know kind of what the person's agenda is, I can go back and read and, and study for those particular things. But uh, it's a little bit nicer to read a little bit ahead. Uh, as I mentioned before, a lot of this class is vocabulary. So those terms that are in the book, that are key terms, that are your flashcards or your notes to yourself, those are really something that gets tested a lot. Any, any other questions about that? Yeah. I was just going to say I missed Wednesday. Mm -hmm. I was either going to get notes from the student or can I just get all the notes? And all the notes needed on Canvas for Wednesday. Uh, well, I mean, when you, when you open up PowerPoint, there's a notes section. Mm -hmm. And that's usually where I've scribbled in the things that I want to talk about. But uh, the specific words that I use or an example I might use, I mean, I just don't know how to capture that other than the video. So maybe that's a whole other conversation. Generally speaking, people like the videos and they're comforting that it's there. And, you know, if you were exhausted or you know, studying for something else and didn't quite catch it that day, you can go back to it. But uh, there's not a lot of people going back to it. Uh, it's there, especially for your sick. So. so I can get the information from Wednesday on Canvas, or should I have the student? Well, I mean, if you click on this, this gets you the power pad. Okay. Any other questions? One of your teams asked me an email question. And that was about fuel. 
uh, uh, parallax. And this is just sort of human interest because after all, it's Friday afternoon. It's kind of a fun story to talk about because one of the aspects of scientism is the belief that science marches stage right onto the screen and the forces of ignorance and superstition and dogma retreat before them. And that's really not how science works. So the word parallax is an interesting one. It's a little bit of a puzzle. So you happen to think that the Earth revolves around the sun. Yes, I have one head top. Look at the sun. And here's the sun. And here's our Earth. And you're saying it goes around the sun. So <clears throat> you're telling me that there are these three small stars out there. Tentacles here and there. Okay. Now, as the Earth goes around the Sun, and you go over here, those stars should look pretty good. They look pretty fresh hard, don't they? And as the Earth is over here, so the stars should start to look like they're a lot closer together. That's kind of the way perspective works. Well, but we know from observing the night sky that as the Earth goes around the sun throughout the course of the year, the stars kind of look like they're the same distance apart. No problem for you? Your theory that the Earth revolves around the sun? Critical conjecture that, oh, gee, you know, I now falsify the belief that the Earth revolves around the sun. We're all waiting for somebody else to say something, or, <laughs> or your beliefs are easily refuted. <laughs> what do you think? How come that doesn't happen? Yeah. Because uh, relatively, when the Earth is <coughs> still. Relatively the same, very far distance away, which doesn't make much of a difference. Yeah, they're way the hell and gone far away. So when Galileo Galilei was interrogated by the Holy Office, they said, you know, hey, Galileo, this model doesn't fit the facts. In order for you to preserve this idea that the Earth revolves around the sun, the stars would have to be infinitely far away almost. And Galileo's response? I don't know. No one would believe that the stars are that far away. Well, it's the case that you know, there was a truth out there that no one was going to consider at the time. And that was an example of Galileo saying, you know, much like the orbit of Mercury that we talked about last time, I don't know. I'm going to go with my theory instead of this possible reputation. Interesting view, you know, actually, Pius at that time was not actually prosecuting Galileo that much. We like to hear a lot about that. Pius put Galileo up in what are kind of luxury apartments, and he was within limits free to come and go as he wished, and he got to see visitors somewhat to the point of the uh, in a dungeon. Um, the other funny thing out there is Galileo stole the piano from Huygens. And at the time that Galileo was producing this idea that the Earth revolves around the sun, there was actually a better theory out there, namely that the Earth revolves around the sun. And like that. And the Earth. The sun, Mercury, and uh, Those things revolve around the sun, but the other planets revolve around the Earth outside Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. And that model actually fit the data better than Galileo's model. It didn't address the parallax problem. It was just sort of you know, out there for fun. 
but it's an example of the fact that you know, even when we have a theory, and even when we're kind of deciding to go down that theory, it may be wrong in some critical respects, and we do not yet have the information to refute it. Now, I'm old enough, born in 1956, to experience that the world has become incredibly big. In 1920, we thought that the Milky Way was it. And there was nothing else but the Milky Way. And then when I was going to school, it was the Milky Way is it. There's the Andromeda galaxy, and there's dust clouds and gas bags out there. And it wasn't until much later that we started to realize actually the galaxy is gone. All those dust bags are in fact stars out there and their own galaxy. Your life will undergo similar changes. And it's easy for us to take pot shots of how stupid people were 100 years ago. 100 years ago, for example, we did not believe in atoms. It wasn't until Einstein was convinced by Bohr that atoms existed that we started to believe in atoms. Ernst Mach was talking about electrical forces. 100 years ago, we didn't believe in evolution. Darwin's origin of species had been revised to the point that it was essentially Lamarckianism. This is why evolutionary people like to cite the first edition of Darwin, because that's where the natural selection hypothesis happens. And it was not until the early 19th century that we started to say, hey, there are these things called genes, and they could just obey mathematical laws. So let me crochet now to this slide, which is a point raised by Imre Lakatos. Lakatos is an interesting fellow. I can't quite get the S on his name, but I'm very close on it. If the communist revolution had not happened, he would have been the prime minister of Hungary. He lost his political influence and went to the London School of Economics where he worked with Karl Popper. But Lakatos addressed that problem that, you know, much like the textbook talks about, when your results don't fit the model, you go back and you've got this choice. You can either twiddle your model and make a little adjustment to it, or you can throw away the theory. And when do you decide to throw away your theory if you're twiddling your model? And Popper at that point had published the logic of scientific discovery. But Lakatos' contribution was that, you know, when you're testing something that a theory says, you kind of got your choices. And given the violent political upheaval that was going on in his country, he, his philosophy analogy is that there is a protective belt that some theories have. And there are other things that are side type, sorry, there's a core theory down here, and there's a protective belt. There are other sort of little adjacent ideas that keep the theory going. And if you're going to kill a theory, you've got to get, you have to attack the core theory. And, you know, one of the things that we can think about is, have we over-adjusted this theory a lot? So I forget now which of you had said they were in developmental psychology, but Jean Piaget was one of the figureheads that you will learn about developmental psychology. Often when kids are doing the types of activities that Piaget looks at, they don't perform the way they ought to. They might be concrete operational in one area and formal operational in another area. I realize those words may not mean a lot to some of you, but the idea is they don't, they won't always perform in exactly the level that they ought to. And being French, you know, it's ah decollage that you know sometimes some activities pull for some types of behaviors and others. But uh, our question is. How do we know when we over adjusted the theory? But the key idea is let's design theories to attack the core ideas. Returning to the book, we need to consider the original idea that scientists work in a community. And Merton had some scientific norms here. 
first is universalism. Some of the fun things about when I teach Dr. Uh, a statistics class is having people think about the data and they'll say, well, you know, this is maybe how I would test the hypothesis. And I'd say, that's great. If you had been born only 40 years ago, you would have been on the cross of one of the leading developments in statistics. Anybody can do science. One of the nice things about Columbia is we do have a high school, high schools, uh, which are really good science teachers. They will do limnology. They'll get out in nature. They'll make measurements. They'll do assays, bioassays of the biological populations and the trees in the community. Some of those things get published. Anybody can do science. Anybody can kind of sort of do psychology. There's a community involved. Maybe there are researchers in the area who think about these things and can give you feedback. And that community is really important. People criticizing your ideas is the only way that we develop. So, well, this is 89. I've seen students come, and I've seen them go. And very frequently, they will do their master's thesis, they'll publish it, and it will come back from the journal and say they rejected it. And the student goes, Oh my gosh, I'm not good. Oh no, I guess you know, this isn't for me. The first time you submit an article anywhere, it's going to get rejected. That's the way the game is played. It's the first step toward getting it published. It's the job of reviewers and editors to be skeptical of your work. And that's how it improves. And Right? Several articles improved dramatically by that piece. Disinterestedness. Scientists are supposed to be looking at discovering the truth. When you're being critical of a research study, this disinterestedness issue is much more important than the book than common discussion often was. One of the examples in the book is this mindfulness improved studying. And there are a lot of benefits of positive psychology. To paraphrase Shakespeare, but you know, they often come to praise Caesar and not to Perry. You know, they're usually coming in with, and this is what I want to show. And that's not science. You need to build your study so that a skeptic of your work would be convinced. So to crochet back to the previous lecture, if you're looking at how grades and alcohol are related, I'm not convinced by saying, well, there's a correlation going on there. Does that correlation still exist after I adjust for some individual differences? Not the least of which, sex of participant, because men drink more than women, newsflash. And secondly, that it seems that people come to us already with their brains damaged from alcohol use in high school. And it's not necessarily collegiate alcohol. That's the thing. That's the thing. So in the book, she talks an awful lot about the fact that you can't have a financial or professional interest in the outcome study. So NIH, NIAAA, Institute of Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism, and Institute of Health are federally funded organizations that are doing so so as to not be funded by business. Having said that, when you're doing work in pharmaceuticals, the efficacy of a drug to treat depression and so forth, it's very important that you have that stock in that company lest your judgments and your decisions about the article be affected by that. So when we publish things, you do have to find, sign a conflict of interest disclosure form that says, you know, you don't have any investment in the outcome. And finally, organized skepticism. People are supposed to not believe what you're saying. And you are not supposed to believe what you're saying. You always look for an exception to counter-argument. I don't know. I tend to 
get confused over whether I'm teaching this class or why the class um, statistics, but I think it was there that I mentioned it, not here. An awful lot of the correlates of alcohol use and problem behaviors on campus are due to a very small number of students. There are about 40 of them, last time I checked. They're male, they're first generation college students, that is, they're the first person to go to college in their families. They self identify that way. And they have a lot of activity with the fraternity system. Not necessarily fraternity members, but they go to all the parties. And the outcome of that lifestyle is not pretty. They tend to have rather naive ideas about what college is about. Um, you know, if you didn't include those people, a lot of the associations have a when I read these now, I say, have you looked at these lyrics? So we're going to be revisiting these topics. Do you have questions about what those terms mean and what they look like? The textbook makes a large deal about whether research is basic, translational, or applied. These are three terms that come out. To be honest, I have kind of a rough idea of putting particular studies into each of these boxes, because even if you are doing basic research, you finish your article by saying, you know, this is important and it could lead to the following solutions to the problem problems in society. So, but you know, in terms of the terms, what you know, basic research, what are we looking at in terms of the brain? What are we looking at, say, in terms of implicit biases that a person may have as they do a study? Um, we're just interested kind of in the facts. If you look to my brethren and sister in quantitative psychology, we might even be interested in just what are the mathematical models you can use for a test? Or how can I think about a whole bunch of variables that I know about you and put them all together to either arrive at discrete types of people, that's how the Steinies work, or patterns of systems that go on, and that's kind of what I do. Translational work is taking these basic ideas, like the hippocampus alcohol thing that I talked about before, and thinking about how that could be used to solve a problem. So her example is, does meditation improve college students' GRE scores? And applied work is then taking that translational idea, she found some answers there, and actually going out into the school and saying, hey, can we improve the scores of students at the school level and society as a whole? Um, so you know, that's... It's kind of a continuum, but you will find that these three terms that I mentioned. Are not the same. It's important that you make the information public. And there's kind of three ways that you talk about. Generally speaking, the university and other scholars are most interested if you publish it somewhere in a journal. The reason for that is that it's a painful process. The minor takes about a year to two years to get done. And it has been through a process of people saying, no, we don't believe that. And to the degree that you can answer that and convince an editor that what you're saying is not to your votes and makes a point, um, and have a product that follows you in subsequent years. You can also go out and present things to a conference. And that's kind of nice because you're letting other people currently in the area know what it is you're doing. And you can bounce ideas up off of other people. It's also an opportunity to socialize and get to know other people and find out a little bit more what the current ideas are that might be the object of your next grant proposal. And finally, you can publish a book. Yes, possible. To publish a book, um, 
when you publish a book, it's going to get vetted a little bit. They'll, the publisher will pay a small number of people to read your book and give feedback about changes. But generally speaking, once the publisher has agreed to publish a book, it's going to happen. So it doesn't get kicked around nearly as much as a scientific project. Now, life is changing, especially in your life, because right now, if you write an article and you want to send it to a journal, but you want other people to read about it, there are these things called archive servers where you can send your article out now and have other people in the scientific community read it now, even though it hasn't been vetted. Similarly, if you want to publish a book, and I have done this, you can log on to Amazon and upload your book and publish it now. And nobody else has to read it except, you know, except your decision to publish it. So you can get things out to the community. It's a little bit harder for me to decide now as a consumer, should I believe an archive article? Should I believe an article from KDP, Kindle Desktop Publishing, which is Amazon's thing, or Barnes & Noble? Should I give that the same weight as something like a professional publisher? But I expect in real life, there is you know, quite a few more scientific developments out there, and it's kind of a challenge to wait what's going to go on. And of course, there's always the University of Google. Type in the terms, see what you find. And you know, often scientists will put out a blog. Professional societies like APA or APS will put out you know, new products that are out there. They can indulge, scientists can also indulge their computer programming and make little simulations or little activities for you to do. All of those things are ways to communicate. The important part is we're trying to make something public. Saying, we got some notes down here. Now, when was it? Uh, journalism is also an issue in digital science. I don't know if you, know, you follow this particular cartoon, but you can do it. Uh, when you do something, Journalists are going to be interested, and it is a way for you as a scientist to, to communicate to the largest community. It has its own issues, though, because you as a scientist are talking to someone who is not a scientist. So I talked last time about the fact that in 8 a.m. classes, you lose thinking. When you talk with journalists, they, they say things like, oh, yeah, well, you know, we all remember going to college and we drank alcohol. Uh, I waited until I was legal, but you know, I spent a lot of time in politics doing that. What's the big problem? Now, it takes a little, you have to be kind to the journalist. I know that, you know, normally in the younger in society, a lot of people do things when they're in college that maybe they haven't done before. But it's also important to remember that about 4% of college students who drink alcohol report spitting up blood in the morning. Yeah, you know, that's, that, that's a sign that they are consuming so much alcohol that it's going to be scarring the esophagus. That's usually a hallmark of extremely late stage alcoholism. And so even though you know, we, say that you know, alcohol use, for example, is normative. I just use that as emphasis. There are real life social consequences to this behavior in the population. And life would be better <clears throat> for society and for the students as a whole if we could get a better handle on it. Getting coverage out there is good. Universities like it when your research gets attended to. After um, my article got published, immediately the MU News Bureau was all over you saying, oh, and when you talk to the media, you know, 
have a computer screen there and it's got to have the MU logo on because you know we want to have product placement there as you talk about it. You know, it's good for the university. But more importantly, it's justifying to taxpayers why it is they should be spending money having people do this kind of work. Is the story accurate? Is the story that you know, students or journalists are quite well placed in saying, is this actually going to be the way things are? Is it, you know, so there's a lot of facts that you can get into. And how complete is it? Is another issue in the budget because they are also dealing with a lot of bandwidth. They don't, they don't have a lot of time to give all the ins and outs of the study that you're looking at. So when you're working with them, you know, some of you will be in your lives. Don't just assume that because someone's with the newspaper and they want to talk to you, that this gives up all of your rights. Say, well, yes, I'm happy to talk with you for your article, but before you publish, please send me a copy of it so I can look at it. So we can correct some of the accurate points as well as some of the you know, issues you may want to think about. It's kind of nice that you know your research goes in, and by the time you come to it, you know, it's been through the journalism machine, you know, your grandma thinks that now the book does a great deal of talking about, oh, you should go with gut intuition. That intuition is bad, and that's why you need scientific information. And actually, that's not true. The scientific process involves a lot of gut information. The important, really, really important topic is that your instincts need to be active at the correct part of the scientific process. So if you remember, Popper is stages, we violate an expectation and we generate lots of possible answers and then we weed them out and come up with the best answer out of everything we've been trying to do. And then we have a new problem at the end. At the stage of generating lots of theories, that's where your intuition, that's where your gut instincts come in. You say, it may be that the reason that people do these things is because they're angry. Because they're happy or because they want to have friends. You can make your own psychological theories. And you might just stare at situations you have in your life and come up with a model. That's fine. That's good. Do lots of them. As a matter of fact, the more gut instincts you can have, the better. But the problem is that we don't let our intuitions come to us in the process of eliminating theories. You kind of have to stand back and say, theories are going to rise and fall based on the data. And I can't come in and go, oh, no, 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 but I really like that theory. It was my favorite theory. It's the prettiest theory. It's a little bit like when Stephen King was writing. There's this idea when you're writing a book that they say, you'll kill, my, you'll kill your darlings, the favorite character in the book, you're going to kill by the end. You don't want to have that person living after it. In the same fashion, you can have lots and lots of theories of the things you might believe in, but at the stage of weeding them out, you need to step back and let those things fall. One of the areas that that's a particular issue in psychology today is the field of positive psychology. We do a lot for journals, and very frequently when I have positive psychology studies, Mindfulness, meditation, uh, relaxing, spending time with your kids. You know, kind of, what kind of ogre says it's a bad idea to spend time with your kids? Is it your mindfulness? I mean, just I practice it myself. But just because I think it's so, it does not make it so. And I can't come back and, you know, in terms of lots of socialist ideas, pull in lots of side explanations for it. And do it cool. Uh, okay. Any questions on that? Eight of you have not yet access the book. 
So if you are having trouble accessing it, let me know. Okay, we have a few minutes to go over chapter two. As I mentioned before, there's all kinds of information out there. The internet, the library, the journals, edited volumes, chapters, and books. And one of the things that this bears on, as we were just talking about, that scientific knowledge is probably superior to your own human experience, what you think you know already, your judgment, intuition, and your creative instincts. And the possibility here is that you might come away with the idea you shouldn't use those, and that scientists don't use them, somehow they are not liable to the problems that we have. So the chapter talks about research versus your private experience. Researchers are in your position when to trust authorities and how to look and find research. So this slide is basically saying what I just been saying. Now, from this last lecture, you might also say, wait a minute, even if I'm making an observation, can I trust that? Because as we talked about, any observation is theory-laden. Any observation so far is no guarantee that this is going to happen in the future. So if you ever play the philosophy class, be able to talk about the problem of induction. Just because an association has been found in the past, the sun rises in the east, is no guarantee that the sun will actually rise in the east tomorrow. Or to use kind of a farm example, I mean, a chicken's lived experience. You hear the farmer running up, you know, plopping up the steps, and every time the plopping happens, food happens afterward. One fine day, the plopping of the steps comes up, and the farmer comes in with an axe and cuts the chicken's head off. You know, the chicken was not justified in believing that every time the farmer comes, food will happen. How or why can we trust science, given that we're never going to know for sure that the best information changes over the course of time? One of the things that you know, have particular relevance in your life is climate change. You know, back in 1989 was the first time I heard about climate change happening. And now we have yet more information. And we can even start talking about heat waves and the likelihood that heat waves are happening given human carbon emissions and running simulations of what would have happened in terms of heat waves if human carbon emissions had not happened. You have a lot better information now than you have. You have a lot faster computers and a lot more data. So, William Hewell and later the psychologist Raymond Patel talked a lot about how we know as a function of something called the inductive hypothetical deductive spiral. And this has some relationships. With Popper's four stage model of problem solving. So let's just kind of walk through this little diagram that I made. He all said, you know, at the beginning, you do start with some kind of an observation. And you might say, you know, I've been observing and observing, and you know, it looks like these two things are linked in practice over the course of time. This now leads to an hypothesis that maybe this variable is causing that, or that these two variables are associated. This hypothesis gives me a deduction of what consequences I should see if I did an experiment. And the experiment is different than just the observation because I'm controlling things. I'm deciding what to look at or what variables that might be in play. That experimental observation will inform my theory. That leads to another induction, to another hypothesis, to another deduction, and so on. It just keeps going and going and going. And that's basically how we take regularities and come up with a theory. So, 
that. So at the time of inductive reasoning, go crazy. Have dreams, talk with people in your residence hall, your favorite coffee shop or on the social media and think about ways that things could happen. And I talked last time about the monkeys holding hands and how that relates to the formation of the hexane ring. It's kind of a, you can do anything that you want to do. You want to have a story in that regard? I kind of do, but it's not pestilentially hot in Missouri. For those of you who are new to this group, one of the wonderful things is you can go out and you can walk around in the parks. And as you walk around in the parks, you start to see that the trees are doing some strange things. So if you walk past a stream, you notice that the maple tree leans out way over the water. And then when we have spring floods, or when the tree gets really big, the tree falls over. Well, how would a tree do such bad things? It's because maple trees respond to light. And in the forest, they grow to where the light is. And where the stream is, there's no trees, so the tree keeps growing and growing more under the light. The maple tree is well adapted to being in a forest. It fights for the other trees. Actually, the maple tree is kind of invasive, and if you want to have some leisure time, the Department of Natural Resources will pay you to walk through state forests and kill maple trees. That's another story. By contrast, though, think about the cedar tree or the pine tree. Cedar trees and pine trees don't do that. As a matter of fact, whatever you do, those cedar trees always grow straight up and down. Well, that's because cedar trees and pine trees generally grow on mountains. If they grew out according to light, they would fall over a lot. Pine trees grow in response to gravitation. Well, in the same fashion, you are growing as well. There are different ways, there are different rules that govern how you grow. And the nice thing about biology is they study this stuff a lot and they come up with bioenergetics. That is actually one of the things that was developed at Missouri in the College of Agriculture, <clears throat> the study of how fast things grow and what things grow differently across species and different types of animals. And the nice thing about that is those mathematical models can be carried forward to psychology. So I'm stealing. I'm walking through the woods and going, hey, you know, there's, there's this literature in biology. Maybe the way you learn, or some of you learn, has a different mathematical model classes than others. I think this has probably happened, at least in all of our careers, that sometimes you go into a class and go, oh, yeah, this makes sense. Well, talk about the first three weeks. I think I kind of got what this class is about. And, you know, it's kind of a coast after that. There are other classes that I take going, what the hell have I got myself? And it doesn't make sense, and it doesn't make sense. And then toward the end, I said, well, why didn't you say that? And you kind of get it. You know, another class is where I never got it. Well, those curves over the course of time can be modeled. And now that we have computers that can get us lots and lots of information, we can start to steal these models from biology and apply them to our research. Uh, sometimes we might steal something and it might not be a good, it might not be a good idea. Are you a tea couple? Emotion is a fascinating thing, folks. Being in philosophy, we have not always thought of emotions the way we now think of emotions. You know, the book talks about 
You just got to get that anger out or you're going to blow up. These theories of psychology happened in the 1800s when we had mechanical things and we're stealing this idea of a mechanism that has pressure in it, an uncomfortable thing, and we release it. But it may not be the case that your emotions are like a tea kettle. If you go back to ancient Greece, they didn't think of emotions the way that we do now. If you read Homer, for example, you will read, and Athena stooped down and pulled Ulysses up by the hair and said, stop. Emotions were thought to come from outside of you and project themselves on you. We might call this in the present day, you know, this battle shock describing a war. But now we tend to think of emotions as something that's interior. This idea of stealing some mechanism, whether it is Athena pulling you by your hair or steam, or can you think of another thing that we've been stealing? Well, we have these things called computers. There's an awful lot of computer modeling about switches and circuits and how long it takes to process things. Our brains don't process things like a computer any more than But to the extent that we grab these ideas from other areas that fall into them, they're also probably not trees, but why is it? Uh, but you know. Be aware that you know, these observations were theory laden and they were stolen from another area. They do not necessarily imply the behavior itself. And so, if you want an example of thinking like a computer, you know, Schifrin's model is exactly different inputs and memories and storage and things going to long term memory. That's Bam, and you know, things get forgotten. It's a little bit like erasing or chip failing. You know, we stole that idea. Now, that doesn't guarantee that it's the truth, but it can never be the truth to generate a useful hypothesis. Here's another model. This is from cognitive psychology. The pandemonium model of perception involves the action of several demons. Yeah, you know, you can take a class in cognitive, but you know, and these demons have a job. These demons here look at features, and then they return their result into a pandemonium of hell, and whichever one shouts the loudest gets into the decision demon's ear. To make a deception as well as perception is. So here you are, you see the letter R, and based on these characteristics, some of the features come in here. The R demon shouts the loudest. That gives the decision demon the, the idea of saying, Oh, I'm seeing the letter R. Inside of it. But it's a useful model that is, I can generate probability statements about observations of people and their conclusions for what the are based on. Okay, I see people are shuffling, so it's kind of. I also need to give myself some time to save the recording. Let's put a pin on that. Start reading chapter two on Monday.